today what I decided uh, that we would do is, uh, is we would do another topical study. And this particular study is going to be um, a brief examination of, of a very familiar passage of scripture, which we traditionally refer to as the Master's Prayer, or as it's known in, in Christian circles as the Lord's Prayer, typically. Uh, and uh, if you look at the uh, the, the Latin pattern, uh, what is it uh, Pater Nostra? I guess it is. It's uh, it's what we refer to as the Our Father, right? Uh, and it's the passage that's found in a couple of places in uh, in Matthew and Luke, and um, and to a much lesser degree in in Mark. But if uh, but we're going to take a look mainly at the the passage that's represented in Matthew six, verses nine to fifteen. So let's uh, let's take a look at that. And what I want us to see today is that there is a lot more going on there than meets the eye. So let's read it first, uh, and then I'll have a lot more to say about it. So Matthew 6, 9 to 15. So it says, pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. And this is, of course, the NASB, New American Standard Bible Version. Uh, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, and actually, we're going only to 13, not, not through 15. Now, one of the first things I, I want you to notice is that uh, the, the the second part of verse thirteen is in brackets, and you've you've heard this uh, spoken like this, this prayer spoken this way. For yours is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever, Amen. But it's in brackets. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that this does not actually uh, appear in in early manuscripts of the Book of Matthew. So it's not really technically there. Um, where it actually comes from is from something that's known as the Didache. Uh, you what might spell that D-I-D-A-C-H-E, Didache, uh, which is uh, the word for teaching, the Greek word for teaching. And uh, it's uh, it's the, the larger document is called the teachings of, uh, of the uh, apostles. Uh, actually, more accurately, it's referred to as the... Uh, the Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the nations, the Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the nations. And what it is, is a early uh, Christian treatise that's written in Koine Greek, which is the language of the New Testament, uh, by anonymous sources that were viewed as somewhat authoritative by the what they call the early church fathers. But they early on they believed the scholars believed that it was written in the second century common era which means in the 100s right but then later other scholars more modern scholars uh tend to think it was still first century but it was not viewed as something uh canonical when i say uh, canonical or when i use the term canon what i mean is that uh it's not it was not these were not writings that were accepted as authoritative to be placed in as part of the new testament so the fact that that's added to the book of matthew means that it's something that is it's not necessarily authoritative although it's consistent with what's being described in matthew and elsewhere but it, it's not it's not coming from a canonical source and you need to realize that and that's why it's in brackets. So we're not really going to cover it today. Um, because although, as I said, it's, it's accurate sentiments, because it's not considered part of the biblical text, I'm not going to consider it in, in this discussion. But I wanted you to know why it's there. Okay. But in any event, uh, nine through 13 is also you'll also see a version of this uh, over in, uh, in Luke, 
So I want to I want to actually take a look at that as well. So I'm going to leave this one up here actually, and we're going to go over to Luke 11 just to see, uh, for comparison's sake, what that looks like. It happened that while Yahshua was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, "Master, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples." And he said to them, "When you pray, say." Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Notice how brief that is, right? As compared to uh, Matthew, which says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. So going back to Luke, he says, uh, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. You see slight differences there, right? And lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. And then when you go over to Matthew, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors as compared to, to for we ourselves, forgive us our sins, our debts, our sins, right? Difference there. For we ourselves also forgive everyone uh, who is indebted to us. And that's what the Greek actually says. So when you look at Luke, it actually says uh, hamartia, which is sins, the word of sins. And when then you look, and when you look at Luke, uh, at Matthew, it uh, it uses the word debts, uh, which is ofel, uh, ofelema, ofelema, which means a debt. So why the difference is there? So we'll talk a little bit all, all, about all that. Just a little context. We saw a little bit of it in Luke, but I want to just go a few verses before in Matthew because they asked him about a prayer. So Matthew starts in verse 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor... Do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. They have their reward because what they're looking for is praise, so they're getting praise. But when you give to the poor, when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, do it anonymously, right? So that your giving will be in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you <clears throat> because you're not doing it for a show. You're doing it out of an act of devotion. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Again, it's an outward display of piety. Truly, I say to you, they have the reward in full. Why? Because people look at them and they say, again, they get praise, right? They look at them and they say, oh, what pious people they are and how holy they are and whatever. It's nonsense. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your father who is in secret. Your, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Because ultimately, it's only his opinion that matters, not the opinion of the people around you. Verse 7, and when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. Right? It's just a ritualistic type of thing. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words, which is not true. So do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. You don't need to repeat yourself over and over because even before you utter a single word, much less repeat it over and over, your father already knows because he knows the desires of your heart. And yet he still wants you to come to him and sh and 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 let him know your needs as well as let express the sentiments of your heart. So pray then in this way, and then we go through the prayer. But I want you to notice some things when you look through this. And I want you to see that there's more going on than meets the eye. So first of all, let's establish one thing with regard to this prayer of the master. So first of all, it's a model prayer, right? M-O-D-E-L. It's a model prayer, meaning it's not really intended to be, you know, just recited over and over again as in some ritualistic way, right? But it's even more than that. It's not just that it's a model or an outline prayer. And sometimes people will say that. And that's something I've said in the past as well, is that it's an outline of the kind of things that you should pray for, the kind of categories that are important. Well, yes, it is that, but it's more than that. It's more than just an outline, okay? Because what it's actually reflecting, it's it's reflecting Yahshua's inner prayer life. This is 
a very intimate prayer that we're seeing here. It's a very personal prayer that Yahshua is, is, uh, is showing us. And by extension, he's showing us how we could be like him, participating in that same intimacy with the Almighty, with the Father, right? And he uses the term Father, which is interesting, because it's a term of, uh, it's an expression of, of, of intimacy, right? When you say Father, he doesn't say, just to say, let me bring it back up on the screen. He doesn't say, um, our Elohim who is in heaven, right? Which he could have said. He says, our Father who is in heaven. The word in Greek is pater, and of course, in in uh, in, in Hebrew, it would have been uh, uh, av. And then in the Aramaic, if it were being spoken in the Aramaic, it would have been Abba, right? And we see later that Paul uses the term Abba twice, uh, in uh, once in Galatians chapter four and once in Galatian, uh, and once in Romans chapter eight. And we'll take a look at that, those later in comparison to what we're seeing here. But Yahshua is giving his disciples who are interested in prayer, who are interested in the way that we should pray, he's giving them <clears throat> the sense of how they should offer their prayers to the Almighty in this outlined model form. But there's much more going on here. Not only is it an intimate uh, expression that Yahshua himself lives his life by, right? And therefore, we would do well following our master, following in our master's footsteps as his disciples to also, by which we should also live our lives. But there's, there's also much more that's being expressed here. And that's what I really want to focus on going through this today. And this, this study will be uh, somewhat short because we have a lot of people out today. But I want, and I'll, I, it's possible I could do a much deeper study on this in the future because there's so much that can be said about this. But I just want to cover just a few things just to kind of whet your appetite. And, um, and give you a good sense of what's going on here. So in addition to Yahshua giving us this intimate sense of prayer, he's also describing what he feels is important with regard to his ministry, his vocation, his calling. In other words, why is he here? So if you want to understand the entirety of Yahshua's ministry, right, this is what you need right here. Because this is what's encapsulating everything that Yahshua was sent to do, right? What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at something like this, you see, and you know, we're, we're recently we began a study of uh, of the Book of Mark, and what we're going to see much of this, Yahweh willing, we're going to see much of this in, in much greater detail. Uh, but when you when you follow the the different things that Yahshua is saying here you're going to see the things that are reflected throughout the Gospels as being representative of his ministry, right? So I want to give you sort of a bird's eye view of it and kind of the, you know, and probably a lot higher than the birds, right? The 30,000 view, I don't think the birds go that high. But uh, so I, I don't want to mix my metaphors too much, but I'm going to give you the, the, the flight view. Let's put it that way. And then I want to go back and take a closer look at, at each of these in, in turn. But let's take a look. So he says, pray then in this way. So what is prayer to begin with? Well, prayer is directed thought, right? It's uh it's 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 almost like a thought download, but it's more than a thought download because a thought download tends to be just something you do with self-reflection where you're talking to yourself and you're just kind of putting out on paper what it is that you're or verbally what it is that you're feeling and what you're thinking. It's not, so it's not exactly that. So the analogy breaks down a little bit because you're not just talking to yourself. You're actually talking to Yahweh, making your needs known. But it has a very similar effect in that you get it out of your head and you get it out into the open or on paper or if you're writing it down. But most, most of the time you're going to do this verbally or at least in your head, verbally in your head, where you're talking to Almighty Yahweh. But it's it's directed thought, it's expressed thought, intimacy, it's it's expressed intimate feelings and thoughts that are brought out before Almighty Yahweh to offer him praise, but also to to ask for for, for our needs. So when you look at each of the things that are that are being requested here, you see quite an interesting uh pattern here. So he says, pray in this way. So the first thing he he does is he starts out with our father, right? 
our father means something very specific. And we're going to take a look. As I said, I want to go too, too deeply just yet. Let me just give you the, the flight view and then we'll come back. But our father is identifying the one to whom our prayer is directed, right? And that is obviously to Almighty Yahweh. But notice we're not saying Elohim necessarily. I mean, you can, right? Obviously, we pray all the time. We say Almighty Yahweh. We say Heavenly Father, Elohim. Well, we say Elohim. And, but sometimes we just say Father, right? So this is this is directing us in a way that we can have a, a great deal of intimacy with him because you speak differently to your father than you do to your king, right? So our father, immediately that's something special that we have to take a closer look at. And it's not just our father, but it's our father who is in heaven, right? So it's not our earthly father, it's our father who is in heaven. So the source is the one who is in heaven, that is where he is from, and it is an acknowledgement of Yahweh as our father, because he's the only one that we know that is in heaven to whom we owe our worship and allegiance. And then it says, hallowed be your name. The word hallowed is uh, the word which means to sanctify, right? Uh, hagiatso. So hagiatso is, is, the, is, a, is a term meaning sanctified, be your name. Holy is your name. It has, it's related to the, to the term for holiness. So why is there an acknowledgement of Yahweh's name being holy? Well, we'll see. Then it talks about your kingdom come. You will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yahshua's central message, as I've been hammering on for literally years now, his central message is that of the kingdom, right? So Yahshua's eschatology, which is the end time, you know, the, the, the study of the end times or the end time message, is a message, it's a kingdom-shaped eschatology, right? And more specifically, it's it's what scholars might refer to as inaugurated eschatology. What does inaugurated eschatology mean? Well, inaugurated, you think of in the United States, every four years, we have an inauguration, right? Inauguration day. That's the day that the president is installed, the new president is installed into office, okay? Well, to so for something to be inaugurated means something that is is begun, right? So the concept of inaugurated, uh, the inaugurated kingdom is the concept that I've, again, been been really pressing on, which is the fact that the kingdom, beginning with Yahshua's death and ascension, resurrection, right? That began the rule of Yahshua, his inauguration, the inauguration of his kingdom. And we're only waiting now over for the course of 2,000 plus years, we're waiting for the final consummation of that kingdom on this earth. But Yahshua, as at this very moment, Yahshua is ruling. And how is he doing that? He's doing that through the work of his assembly on the earth. And it's a mop-up operation, as I've described it, where we are essentially doing our thing contrary to the forces of darkness, showing Yahshua to the people on this earth, witnessing to what his will is, so that people can turn from the, the way that they're living and that they could give their allegiance to that king who is here, right, in the presence of his spirit. So it's not that he's far away and he's coming someday. Like people, you know, we we have that impression that the second coming means that he's going to, he, he's gone far, far away. And then all of a sudden now he's going to come. No, he's he's there. He's right near us in the presence of his spirit. But in terms of his physical presence on the earth, in terms of the way that it's described in a place like the book of Revelation, that has not yet occurred. That has not been consummated. It's very similar to what you see in uh, in the ancient world, as I've described, where the Caesar would, you'd have a new Caesar, like Caesar Augustus, and there'd be a proclamation of good news, which is the word gospel, that that king, there's a new king, but he wasn't necessarily physically there yet. You still have battles and skirmishes going on, and people are getting prepared so that when he does arrive, he will have his subjects in order. And that's what's happening with Yahshua. It's an, an inaugurated kingdom eschatology, which some people will not agree with. That's fine. We can have that conversation. But I am firmly convinced that that's exactly what's happening. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this is a kingdom-shaped prayer. So the centrality of this is that the message of Yahshua that the kingdom is something that we want to proclaim anywhere and everywhere so that Yahweh's will 
over the course of time is going to be done here as it's already being done in heaven. It's also an acknowledgement that the cosmology of the Bible, in other words, the view of how the world and universe and the elements and everything work, is such that it is a it is a, a interlocking between heaven and earth. It's not heaven off way far away and earth over here. It's heaven and earth that have always been meant to be together as one unity that interlocked and intersect. But because of sin, that was thrown into turmoil. And the whole message, uh, not message, but the whole pattern of tabernacle worship and temple worship were given by Almighty Yahweh. That pattern was shown to Moses on the mount and by extension came eventually through the scriptures to us so that we could see the model of what the interlocking of heaven and earth look like. So that when we come before Almighty Yahweh in worship, we are we are having an experience where heaven and earth are intersecting because it's a tabernacle-like experience. It's a temple-like experience. The current temple not being a temple made with hands, but the current temple being a temple that is Yahshua himself, the body of Messiah, right? That consists of Yahshua himself as the chief cornerstone and every single one of us and all the believers throughout history to the present day as stones, living stones in that temple, okay? And when you're in the temple, it's not like you're in heaven, you are in heaven because you are presenting yourself before Almighty Yahweh in an atmosphere in which heaven and earth have interlocked, okay? And there's a lot more that could be said about that, but that's what, what this is describing, this intersectionality between heaven and earth. And then we have, give us this day our daily bread. This is a recognition of our dependence on Almighty Yahweh for our spiritual and our temporal food. Okay? But there's more going on there as well. So we'll come back to that. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So the concept of forgiveness is a central feature to the kingdom message. We can't have a kingdom if there is no forgiveness. Forgiveness is, is key. When you think about what happened in the very beginning, it becomes clear, right? That we had a fallen world because Adam and Eve decided to go their own way instead of following what Yahweh had, had had shown them. And only because of Yahweh's forgiveness, only because of his grace, only because he forgave them, because of the, the, the shed blood of that animal, which was representative ultimately of the shed blood of Yahshua the Messiah. And then that pattern became the pattern by which the Messiah would, would restore humanity to Almighty Yahweh through forgiveness of sin. That's central to the message. And because our master forgave sin, and you see that throughout the gospel message, because the master forgave sin, we also, as his followers, must also forgive sin. Because we're following in his footsteps. So it's central to the kingdom message. And then, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So there are two things that are actually being described here that are somewhat related, and that is this concept of being led into temptation. The word is perasmos, and the word perasmos can be either temptation or test. Temptation is probably not the best terminology here, but more the concept of, of testing, and I'll describe that in greater detail. By the way, you know, the scripture says that Yahweh doesn't tempt us, right? We see that in the book of James, so it doesn't mean that Yahweh's tempting us, like all of a sudden he puts, you know, uh, a uh, member of the opposite sex so that you you know so that you have lust that that's the Yahweh doesn't do that, he doesn't play games like that. There is testing that Yahweh will allow to mold and shape our character, but this is something that's deeper than that. This is something that's more it's it's on a higher level than personal individual testing per se. And we'll talk a little bit more about it. But then there's also the concept of deliverance from evil. And depending on the version that you're looking at, uh, Paneras. It's uh, it's it's either evil or the evil one. Some versions will say deliver us from the evil one. Well, I believe based upon different things that I've read that we're not just talking about the evil one, meaning Satan, although he is representative of one such evil. But I believe that the the Hebrew underpinnings to this is more the concept of from deliver us from all evil. Okay, it's like what you see over in uh, and let me see if I can find. Of which Satan is is part of that, right? Psalm uh, one twenty one. Yahweh will protect you from all evil; he will keep your soul. 
he will Yahweh will guard your going out and you're coming in from this time forth and ever. So it's more like this, that Yahweh will protect you from all evil, from every form of evil, right? And um, and and so whether you're talking about the evil one or all evil in general, it's it's a request that Yahweh would deliver us from every form of evil so that we uh, don't have to contend with those, those dark forces. And as I said, they're related because Yahshua, our Messiah, our King, our Master, he had to go through this so that we wouldn't have to go through that, right? We're still, but there's still a recognition, again, because we, some versions say sore testing, right? In other words, we don't, we're, we get, we're always going to be asking Almighty Yahweh to be with us so that we don't crack under pressure. That's what we're getting at here, right? Because we know that because we live in this world, we're going to go through testing. We're going to be exposed to dark forces, deliver us from evil. But the request is that Almighty Yahweh, in the same way that he's providing for our provisions of bread, in the same way that he's forgiving our sins, in the same way that he is preparing the place for us, right? He That he will also keep us from cracking under the pressure, right? It's kind of like what Yahshua was uh, saying to the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, if you remember, right? In Matthew 26, verse 40, and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and said to Peter, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation, into testing, right? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? This is what we're talking about. So, so let's go back and, and let's look at this a little bit more deeply. So we talk about our father. Uh, we're talking about uh, a, a much more <clears throat> intimate connection than just calling him our Elohim or our king. There's, there, there are also allusions to different things in the scripture. So, uh, and, and one of the things, let me just go back to the, by the way, can you see these different tabs when I'm changing? Okay. So when you go back to Matthew, when you read through this, this whole outline, <coughs> all of these things have a parallel in the Exodus. Right? So when I say that there's more going on here than meets the eye, I mean it in a very deep sense, right? This is Exodus language. It's also temple language woven into there as well. But let's talk about the Exodus nature of it, right? Yahshua's ministry was the ministry of inauguration of a new Exodus. I hope we realize that. It's no longer, though, an Exodus, of course, from Egypt, from a physical Egypt, nation of Egypt, but the physical nation of Egypt, Exodus, was the prototype of a greater Exodus. An Exodus from what? From what slavery, right? And some people will buck against this concept because they say, well, you know, we're not in slavery, we're not in Egypt, we're not in Babylon anymore, in exile, whatever. No, but we're in a spiritual slavery because we are still under the effects of a foreign of, of of being scattered among foreign nations that don't know Yahweh and forces and powers that are enslaving people in a similar way to the way in which Pharaoh enslaved uh, Israel and Egypt. That's why it's such a, 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 a powerful motif. And the whole concept of the returning Messiah, or not the returning, but the, the coming Messiah in ancient Israel and in particular in the first century common era, when Yahshua made his appearance, is that everyone was waiting for Yahweh to return to Zion in accordance with what the prophets said. And when Yahweh returned to Zion, certain things would happen. He would throw off the yoke of the foreign oppressor, like the Romans, for example. And he would, you know, heal the sick and he would, you know, and he would set aside the destructive forces of darkness and he would inaugurate uh, a new a new land a new a new earth a new creation well because things didn't happen in the way that people thought that they would happen then they rejected yahshua as the messiah but what they failed to see is that everything is happening over the course of time in accordance with the plan and in, in accordance with the plan that's very true to scripture and it wasn't going to happen overnight the way that they described it it was going to happen according to Yahweh's timetable and in his way. It's like every time that 
there was a uh, that someone came up with a, a concept about the kingship about about kingdom yashua said well it's not going to be that way it's like this so if you go to matthew 13 and you have several parables the kingdom of yahweh is like this the kingdom of yahweh is like such and such the kingdom of yahweh is like so why did yashua have to give so much explanation in parables about the kingdom because people didn't understand what the kingdom was really going to be like. Because you had all these concepts of this warrior Messiah coming with violence to destroy and to kill. And, and that's not how the Messiah would come. The Messiah would come on a donkey, not on a charger for war, you see. So when you go even to the book of Revelation, you go looking in the future and you see the description of Yahshua coming on the, on the white charger. In, in that description there, even that is symbolic metaphorical language. I hate to burst bubbles, but that's what it is. It's not describing an actual violent attack of the Messiah upon this upon the forces of darkness, because it would be antithetical to what Yahshua taught all his ministry and in his words, which was love, the power of love and not the power of violence. The way that Yahshua is going to is capture this world is through self-sacrifice, through self-sacrificial love. That's what he did, and that's what we're supposed to do as his followers as well. And when you look in the book of Revelation at the ones who are following the Lamb, that's exactly how it's being done. It's being done through self-sacrificial love. It's not being done through violence. And the description that you see later in Revelation 19, if you read it carefully, is also consistent with that view and not with the view of violence. But that's a discussion for another day. But going back to the Exodus language, Yahshua is going to be, not going to be, he has already inaugurated a new exodus. And the kind of language that we're seeing described here in the, the Master's Prayer is consistent with that new exodus. So when you look at our Father here, there's more going on. This is meant to elicit exodus language, right? When you go over to Exodus 4, and Moses appears before Pharaoh. By the way, the concept of Yahweh as Father is 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 not unknown to Judaism, but it's rare in Judaism. And it's certain places where you see that, and this is one of those places early on that you see there, where Elohim is described as a father. And specifically, he says what? He says to Pharaoh, verse 22, this is Exodus 4, 22, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says Yahweh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me, but you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. So is there is there a coincidence that we're talking about a son, a firstborn here? No coincidence at all. It's an allusion to eventually the one who will save us, who is the firstborn, right? Israel is my son, my firstborn. It's the, it's the, uh, um, it's the, and by the way, look at the word there, firstborn, the word behor down the lower left. And I, I haven't looked it up, but I bet anything that that word is related to the term bichorim, which is the term for first fruits. Okay, again, coincidental? I think not. So Israel is my son. He's he's my. It's it's a metaphorical connection with Israel as his son. And therefore, Yahweh is Israel's father. You see. So when you're looking at uh, when you're looking at uh, much of the language. In the the in, in certain passages, for example, in the prophets and, and in the New Testament, where it's referring to a father-son type of relationship, this is what the allusion is to, to Israel as his son, as his firstborn. You see it again also in, in Hosea. Those are the two main places where it, where it appears. When Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. There it is again. So this concept of Elohim as our father, it's 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 deliberately meant to evoke remember the script the, these yashua came to a, a jewish people who understood the scriptures so when people read when people heard that and later when they read it as part of these accounts they would have made a connection to israel and out of egypt i call my son and there's a dual thing right because we know that yashua was called out of egypt as his son but yashua is the representative of all of the sons of Israel, right? He's the suffering servant, but also the primary son among many sons, because Israel in general is his son. So when you look at the, the suffering servant described in Isaiah 53, <clears throat> people get heartburn over that because they say, well, that's describing Israel. It's not describing a Messiah. Well, it's describing both. 
right? So I, I there was a time when I didn't even understand that. I thought that, well, people are just not ref they're refusing to see. No, it's describing both. It's describing Israel as the as as suffering through the kind of things that they suffered over the years, but it's describing one, there's a language shift within there that describes one individual who is a representative of all of those people who have suffered. And there are certain things written in Isaiah 53, and the grammar the, the, and the grammar is such that it's referring to one person, but it's referring to that one person taking on all of that pain and suffering on behalf of the entire nation. And in the same way that suffering servant is representative of the entire nation, in the same way that one son is representative of all of the nation as sons. So when you look at that language back in Matthew of our father who is in heaven, it's our father, right? Not just my father who is in heaven, right? Our father, because he's the father of us all in a spiritual sense, because we're Israel, you see. So our father who is in heaven, so it's, it's Exodus language, right? And notice that in both those passages, both in Exodus 4 and in Hosea 1, out of Egypt I called my son, right? It's an exodus, you see, and that's what's being described here, because this is a new exodus that's occurring, an exodus not out of physical Egypt, but an exodus out of spiritual Egypt, which has gone by many names over the years, right? Whether it's Babylon and Rome and in our day, where, wherever we find it, because it's not the nation. It's what the nation represents, which is which is the powers of darkness and evil, you see. The oppressive forces that enslave. That's what Yahshua came to, to liberate us from, from the forces of this world that enslave. You know, and we can go to several passages in the New Testament that say, you know, do you want to be enslaved to the elemental forces again, right? That's Paul, I believe, in Galatians and on and on. Right there, you see that all throughout. We don't want to become enslaved to the idols and to the because what is an idol? An idol is a force. Okay, right. An idol is not a is not a. Let's let's change shift our thinking. An idol is not a little wooden statue or a little metal statue. Right. Yes, it is those things in a technical sense, but it's not those things itself. Those things represent a greater concept. And it's the greater concept that we have to be worried about. That's the real idol. It's not the little piece of wood and stone. It's nothing that can be crumpled and, and, and torn apart and broken down, right? It's the thing behind that. It's the force that's being worshipped behind that, right? And uh, 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 N.T. Wright, in, in the conference that my wife and I just attended, brilliantly spoke about those idols. And he described the three main idols of our day, which are mammon, Mars and Aphrodite, right? And they have different names depending on who's described. So Mars would be the Roman name for the Greek Ares, and uh, Aphrodite would be the Greek name for uh, for uh, Venus uh, among the Romans. And then Mammon, of course, Yahshua described Mammon, said you can't serve both Yahweh and Mammon, Yahweh and money, right? So what is Mammon? Mammon is money. And what is Ares? Ares is the god of war, well, Mars, if you call him Mars, either one, and but it's it's more than war. It's it's really the 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 god of violence, of which war is the ultimate example, the ultimate intense example of violence, which is outright war. And then of course Aphrodite is the goddess of erotic love, which is the fact that people simply put worship sex, right? So sex, power, money, right? Because power is is also violence, right? War. <laughs> those are the three major forces that, and there's nothing new under the sun, right? Those are the things that have been worshipped for thousands of years, right? From 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 Adam and Eve, even right downward. We're not talking even, to, you know, not, not even talking three or four thousand years ago. We're talking whatever time, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Those forces have been worshipped in some way, shape, or form, and those are the things in their many manifestations that oppress nowadays. And Yahshua conquered those things. And we too, as his servants, are to fight against those things so that we can press forward you know, in, a, in a pure state of holiness, right? So the idea of your hallowed be your name here is, uh, and I, I, I just went into detail about our father, but who is in heaven. So he has, uh, he, he is a, he is coming from 
that uh, part of the intersection of heaven and earth that is unaffected by our pollution, right? In our sector, basically. So we have to rely upon him and his ways. And furthermore, he is holy. He is hallowed. His name is hallowed. I can go any number of directions here with regard to hallowed be your name. It's a recognition that he deserves our allegiance and our loyalty and our attention because he is holy. He is kadosh. And we are to strive for holiness. And how many passages could we turn to describe that? Going back to Exodus, right in the very beginning, right? Or chapter before in Exodus 3, when Yahweh reveals his name. Uh, or not really reveals it because they knew it, but he explains his name. So he he re-reveals it, I guess, to Moses. And he describes himself and his character and who he is. And then throughout the scriptures, you have example upon example about the name of Yahweh being holy. And in the New Testament, you see that as well. You don't see it quite as often in the New Testament, but it's there as well. And we could find many passages, I'm sure we could prove that, and I don't have the time to do that right now. But it's a description, it's an acknowledgement, maybe it's the word I'm looking for, that the one whom we serve, who is from heaven, that he is holy, his name is holy. Right? I'll give you one example in Yahshua's with Yahshua himself over in John 17, which is referred to as the high priestly prayer. So he's speaking to Yahweh. He says in verse 6, I have manifested, to manifest is to make known, to reveal. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me, right? And on and on. And he says down to uh, on verse 11, uh, Holy Father, keep them in your name the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are, shades of the Shema, which says what? Yahweh is our Elohim. Yahweh is one. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name. What does that mean, to keep them in your name? He was keeping them in the holiness of his name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished but the son of perdition. In other words, he kept them within the ownership of his name, right? Another place that you'll see this, and there's more that I could read there, you see it over in Revelation chapter 7, where it talks about the four angels at the corners of the earth that are ready to, to let judgment out. And then I saw another angel in verse 2, ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living Elohim. The seal is within the ring, so to speak, and the ring has an identifier. What is the identifier? It's the mark and it is the seal, and it is more often than not a name. And in this case, that's what it is. It is the name of Yahweh that is the seal. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of our Elohim on their foreheads. And then he goes and he seals the servants, identifying them as his own by his seal. So what makes me think that this is his name? Well, because this is a direct allusion to Ezekiel 9, when judgment is about to be poured out upon uh, upon the, the upon Israel. And it says <clears throat> in verse uh, 3, Then the glory of the Elohim of Israel went up from the cherub on which it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed in linen, at whose loins was the writing case. And this is an angel waiting for judgment. Yahweh said to him, go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sign and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst. But to the others, he said in my hearing, go through the city after him and strike. Do not let your eye have pity and do not spare. Utter utterly slay all men, young men, maidens, little children and women, but do not touch any man on whom is the mark, and you shall start from my sanctuary. Don't touch any man on whom is the mark. What is the mark? So this is an exact situation, a parallel to, it's not the same situation, but it's an exact parallel to what you're seeing in Revelation 7. And so, in other words, make sure that you mark the people first before you release judgment. And what is the mark? The mark is on the foreheads, which is like it says in Revelation 7. What is the mark? The word mark, if you look in the lower left, is the, is, is the, the letter tau. That's what it is. It's tau. It's the alphabetic letter tau, which uh, is which represents what? It's an X in ancient Hebrew, in ancient Paleo-Hebrew. 
You ever heard someone say, I can't write, but so they say X marks the spot. That's what it is. It's X marking your name. So it's a representation. The word, the Tao is a representation of a name, which is what name? It's Yahweh's name on the foreheads of the people, you see. So this concept of hallowed be your name, it's the concept that we belong to him. It's a concept of ownership. It's it's the same, it's, it's an extension of let my son go because he's my son, right? Let my people go because they hold my, they bear my name, you see. So, so justice very free. See how much is going on just in this first verse? It's, 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 it's Yahweh, it's, it's all those who acknowledge Yahweh as theirs, right? And Yahweh acknowledges them as his. It's um it, it's it's an extension of this concept of father. It's my father, it's my Elohim, it's the one whom I serve, it's the one whose bond servant I am, you see. So this imagine if you prayed this prayer in some form daily, you would be acknowledging yourself as being intimately connected with Almighty Yahweh, both in a father-son relationship or father-daughter relationship, of course, by extension, or in 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 the by the fact that you are called by his name because he is yours, he owns you. You are sealed with his name, you see. And I, I don't want you, I don't want to emphasize too much. The, the the pronunciation of the name. That's not what I mean necessarily. Although there is some of that too, but I think that there are groups out there, you know, of whom I speak that make way too much emphasis on that. But we are Yahweh's, we are his. Then it says, your kingdom come, you will be done on earth it is in heaven. So again, this goes back to the idea of intersectionality between heaven and earth. So his will is already being done in heaven. That's why his his father who is in heaven, he's the source and he's holy. Hallowed be your name, right? Heaven is not tainted with the corruption that we're that that the earthly portion of that intersection is undergoing. So the idea of a temple and a tabernacle to be constructed, the idea was to purify that tabernacle or temple so that we could have intimacy with Elohim. That's the Day of Atonement service. That's all the daily offerings and sacrifices to remove impurities and to place them in the sanctuary. And then on the Day of Atonement, it's all removed and the sanctuary is cleansed so that we can have an intimate relationship with Yahweh. Too much to go into here, but I've been through much of this before, especially when I went through the book of Leviticus. You could check out, when I get those on, on the YouTube channel, you can check out the accounts on Leviticus. But the idea here is that we're asking Yahweh that as quickly as possible that his will will spread, his glory will spread throughout the earth, like the prophet says, so that the glory of Yahweh will cover the earth like the waters cover the seas, right? And that's interesting because the seas are waters. So what is this about the waters covering the seas? It's all of Yahweh's presence covering the entire creation. And this is what we want. This is this is all new creation that's being described here, yes? Which is Exodus. You're leaving the, the confines of slavery under, un, under a foreign entity, which is ruled by all this foolishness of the earth and these elemental forces of the earth. And instead, you are now being set free into new creation. And that is described everywhere, everywhere. If you look, just one big example, Romans chapter 8. Uh, let's, let's start with maybe verse 17. And if children, all right, well, let's let's go up a little bit. And this is, by the way, one of the instances of, uh, of the word Abba. And this is a connection. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. If you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So we're supposed to move towards sanctification because in the same way that our Father is holy, we are also to be holy. Verse 14, for all who are being led by the spirit of Elohim, these are sons of Elohim. There it is again, a connection as sons. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again. So what is being described there? Sons of Elohim, you're not receiving the spirit of slavery leading to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. 
What is that? That's an exodus. We're describing an exodus here, right? It's it's exodus language. Never forget that. Never take these verses and these passages, you know, as people who don't know the scriptures, because you know them. And you know that these things are tied one to the other. There's nothing that is new in the New Testament, right? Quote, unquote, New Testament. It's all fulfillment of things that have been described in the Tanakh and the, in the sacred scriptures, right? So for all who are being led by the Spirit, they're sons of Elohim. Israel is my son, right? For you have not received the spirit of slavery. You're not in slavery in Egypt. You're not in fear of Pharaoh. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit, and by the way, you're being led by the Spirit of Elohim. What is that? That's the that's the pillar. It's it's the parallel to the to the pillar of cloud and fire that leads you out of Egypt. You see, to where? Where is it leading you to? Well, we're going to find out. <clears throat> the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of Elohim. And if children heirs also, there's much more going on here too, but I can't go into it. And if children heirs also, we're heirs. Heirs of Elohim and fellow heirs with Messiah, if indeed, notice, if indeed it's conditional. If indeed we do what? We suffer with him. So part of what our calling is, is to suffer with him, which is going to be described in a little bit with the, the temptation, with the testing, and with the deliverance from evil, right? There's a, there's a suffering that's involved here because it's part of the deal. And I, 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 want, I don't have time to go to it, but in the book of Revelation, as I mentioned, when you look at the lamb and the ones who are following the lamb, the ones who are following the lamb look a lot like him because they're also suffering. It's part of the deal. If indeed we suffer with him, so, so that, because it's not, that's not the end. The suffering is not the end. If indeed we suffer with him for a greater purpose, what's the greater purpose? So that we may also be glorified with him. So that we may also be glorified. What does that mean to be glorified with him? What it means, it means new creation, that we may be revealed, that we may be uh, uh, become part of that new creation. To be glorified with him means to, 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 to get a spirit body as he got. It's what you see described in places like 2 Corinthians 5, where the uh, and, and and 1 Corinthians 15, where the incorruptible is thrown off excuse me, the corruptible is thrown off and the incorruptible is taken on. That is what it means to be glorified with him. We are, we are, we, be, we become, <clears throat> he was the first fruits and then we become glorified after him as part of new creation. And it continues, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time, the things that we're going through at this present time, even though it's painful, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed with us. It's, it's going to be overshadowed by the glory that we're going to have, the kind of things that we're going on right now, whether it's the mourning, the suffering, the testings, or whatever we're dealing with, right? For the anxious longing of the creation, all of creation, the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of Elohim. That's you, that's me, right? For the creation was subjected to, and by the way, notice that word, for the revealing of the sons of Elohim, that word revealing in the lower left, apocalypse, apocalypse, it's the, the concept that you use in the, uh, from which the word in the book of Revelation comes from. It's a revealing, the unveiling of the sons of Elohim. For the creation, all of creation, was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. In other words, Yahweh allowed it to go in that direction in, in because of the fall, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of Elohim. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. It's described like a labor, right? And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves because we're suffering now, right? We're waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Notice the redemption of our body. That's resurrection. For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. And this concept saved, this is not some personal individual salvation that the way that Christianity, traditional Christianity looks at it, that all we're doing is we're waiting to be saved to go to heaven. That's not at all what's being described here. This is talking about a grander thing. This is talking about new creation. Salvation is salvation from this entire corrupt system. This is not some puny idea here. This is a broad concept of the entire creation being saved. 
humanity through resurrection and then the rest of creation restored and brought back to its Edenic beauty. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? It's kind of like what it describes in uh, in the book of uh, Hebrews about faith. But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. Sometimes we don't even know what to say. We're in such we're in such anguish that we just leave it to the Spirit of Yahweh. Right? We do not know how to pray as we should. Notice the connection to prayer into Matthew 6. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of Elohim. And on and on it goes. There's, there's more in here. And, and that, that would be nice to go through, but we don't have time. So let's go back to uh, Matthew 6. So, uh, so the kingdom coming is new creation being put into full force, right? Give us this day our daily bread. Oh, I can't even, where do I even begin, right? Give us this day our daily bread. I'm just going to verbally just say a couple of things and, and we'll have to do a deeper study someday, right? So we're talking about our daily bread, which is our daily sustenance. Bread is the most basic food of the world, right? In whatever culture, everybody has bread, okay? Give us this day our daily bread. And that bread is representative of, of, food in general, right? Because it's the most basic of foods and it's representative of nourishment, right? So you think about the place from which Yahshua came. Do you think it's any coincidence that uh, out of you, Bethlehem Ephrata, right? Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, house, literally house of bread, house of food, house of nourishment. Should it, is it any coincidence that the, that the Messiah would have come out of Bethlehem, out of the house of bread, the house of nourishment? No coincidence, whatever. It's manna, right? John six, he gave us manna from the world in the wilderness, yes, to keep us alive. You know, let's let's take a quick look at that. He said, and this this follows in the footsteps of the low one of the uh, situations of the the loaves and fishes. He's feeding people, you see, as a shepherd who loves them. And then when you continue in in chapter six, a little bit further down. And by the way, notice this too in passing, John 6, 27. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father Elohim has set his seal. You see that connection? And then let's go down here. Truly I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of Elohim is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Master, always give us this bread. And Yahshua said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me <clears throat> will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. And he continues from that, right? Uh, talking about the bread. I am the bread that came down out of heaven. And on and on. Okay, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So I was talking about his sacrifice, his resurrection. But, but it's not just that. Some versions, right? So if you look at, you know, at Luke, it says, give us each day our daily bread. Give us each day, give us day by day, which it doesn't say, it says, give us this day in Matthew. But Luke says, give us each day our daily bread. In other words, it's a provision. It's it's. But Matthew refers to it as daily bread, meaning that it's given daily. When in the, the manna in the wilderness, what did Yahweh say to them? Do you remember? In Exodus, he said, go out every day and collect it. And on the sixth day, collect double portion because in the Sabbath, none is going to be given. Why in the Sabbath is nothing given? Because the Sabbath, you've arrived. It's the kingdom. You don't need bread. You're, you're with the Father on the kingdom, right? In the kingdom. This is what we know with hindsight, yes? But he told them in Exodus, and we're not going to turn back to it, Exodus 16, but he said, go out every day and collect the bread. You have to you have to go for it, all right? You, you have to want it. Collect the bread every day. He gave them daily bread. So whether it's 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 uh, how Luke is saying it, give us uh, day by day. Each day you're going to get some. Or the way Matthew says it, give us this day. So 
don't look for, like Yasha says later in the chapter, don't worry about tomorrow, worry about this day, right? So both of those meanings are acceptable and both of those meanings are intended because they're in the separate accounts. Be asking for the bread to, from Almighty Yahweh every day because it's reliance upon him every day. It's daily bread. He gives us that bread every day. And it's not just Yahshua, right? Which is, of course, he's the bread of life. Yes, seek after Yahshua every day. But it's also your daily sustenance, your daily uh, provisions. Trust in Almighty Yahweh day by day to give you the provisions that you need because he's the only one that can do that. And sufficient to the day is the evil of it. Don't worry about tomorrow, what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to clothe yourself with, right? He's going to give us the daily bread each day. And then forgive us, verse 12, our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. So as I said, forgiveness is central to the message of the kingdom. Because in the same way that uh, <clears throat> in the same way that Adam and Eve fell and forgiveness was required, through the Messiah, we have forgiveness of sins, right? It's the message of Day of Atonement, yes? Is the message of the Passover and the days of unleavened bread. It's, it's, it's all throughout the scriptures. But it's not just us receiving forgiveness, but because we receive forgiveness, we also must forgive those who have wronged us. That's why you have the Matthew 18 process, right? That's why you have other passages of scripture that describe if you, in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, if you, uh, if you have a gift and you, you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift. And go and be reconciled first to your brother, and then go and present the gift. In other words, you have to be right with other people before you can be right with Almighty Yahweh. It's part of the concept of love, right? That's gonna that makes the world go round. Okay. Forgive us our debts. And the concept of debts and, and debtors, it's 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 a it's a uh, a connection with the Hebrew here. And I, I read this recently, but it's worth reading it again. And this is from uh, a Prayer to Our Father uh, by Nehemiah Gordon and Keith Johnson. And they're giving the Hebrew underpinnings of the uh, of the, the Master's Prayer. And in one section, they talk about the debts. And this is what they say. It says, those who read, this is on page 146 of this book, A Prayer to Our Father. Those who read this section of the Avinu Prayer, Avinu means Our Father in, he in Hebrew, those who read the section of the Avinu prayer, forgive us the debt of our sins as we forgive the debt of those who sin against us. Uh, in, those who read this in Greek or in an English translation of the Greek cannot help but notice a major discrepancy between the wordings in Luke and Matthew. <clears throat> in Luke, the prayer says, forgive us our sins. And I showed you that, amartia, right? But in Greek, Matthew, it says, forgive us our debts, which is the word of Ophela, Ophelia, uh, Ophelema, uh, Ophelema, okay. So uh, the reader of these two Greek gospels can only wonder whether Yahshua really spoke about sins or debts. Well, the answer to this question lies in the Hebrew source behind the Greek. <clears throat> the problem that faced the Greek translators of the prayer was that the Hebrew word for forgiveness, mahol, literally means to cancel a debt. Kind of like what you see when you think about the sabbatical year and the debts are canceled, and the jubilee year when the debts are canceled, you're canceling a debt. In Greek, it sounds strange to ask Elohim to forgive a debt because this is a term associated with banking and finance. It would be like someone in modern English praying to the Almighty, Oh, Father, forgive me my mortgage. Although if anyone wants to do that, I'm very happy to accommodate that. This is what it would have sounded like to the ancient Greeks when they heard a literal translation of Yahshua's Hebrew prayer. The Greek translators must have asked themselves, how can we convey in Greek the Hebrew idea of forgiveness as the cancellation of a debt? Greek Matthew accomplished this by the phrase, forgive us our debts, which must have sounded odd to the ancient Greeks. Luke, on the other hand, uh, decided on a translation more appropriate for the Greek language, forgive us our sins. But in doing so, he lost some of the flavor of the original Hebrew. Without the Hebrew, he would have, we would have to wonder which gospel authentically preserved the words of Yahshua. Well, I'm not so sure about that, but anyway. When in fact, both Greek gospels are reasonable translations that approximate the Hebrew. And then he goes on to describe that uh, a little bit more in greater detail. But <clears throat> the idea is that of forgiving sins, sins and debts. Well, when you sin against Yahweh, it's like you owe a debt, right? There's something that's left undone. 
when you sin against another person, it's like the feeling of owing a debt. Anyone, anyone who's ever had a, t a, a, a who's, who's who's ever had a tiff with someone else knows that it feels like it feels terrible. And then when you go and you reconcile, it feels great. It's a very similar feeling to being to getting rid of a debt because you no longer have that thing weighing on your shoulders. So it's very easy for me anyway to see that connection between debts and sin. So the but but the key here is that we're supposed to do it. That in the same way that we have been forgiven, we have to forget, we have to also forgive others. So you were asking Elohim, forgive us our debts because we've also forgiven our debtors. Because right, it's like it's like that account that Yahshua gives, which I won't go into right now, but the account where we have the servant who owes money to a king and the king forgives him and it's a very paltry amount and then all of a sudden he he goes out with great joy because this debt this load of debt has been lifted from him and then he remember he goes out and he finds a servant that owes him a little pittance of money actually yeah, it's the other way around the, the the guy who owes the king owes a lot a lot of money i said that wrong and then he he's forgiven of that and then he goes and he finds a servant on his way back home and the servant owes him this little pittance a paltry amount by comparison and in, instead of forgiving him as he had been forgiven, he goes and he throws him into into prison. And when the when the master hears about that, I said a king, but it may be a master. When the master hears about that, he uh, that's why I don't like to just pop stuff without going and reading the text. I don't remember if it was a king or a master, but the point is that he that when the person who was generous and forgave that individual finds out how he treated the servant, then he grabs them and he gets them back into prison. And now it's going to be worse for him than it was before. Because he had bad heart to not forgive. We're supposed to forgive others, right? This is why you leave the gift and then you go and reconcile with your brother first. And then you go back and you give the gift. Because this is how the kingdom works. This is the Sermon on the Mount, right? The Beatitudes. This is how the kingdom looks like. What the kingdom looks like. And then do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So the concept here is the concept of not, not asking Yahweh to not allow us to reach the breaking point in the trials and tribulations that we have. So if you go over to Matthew 26, <clears throat> you see that Yahshua was taking on the forces of darkness so that we wouldn't have to, right? So he says, verse um, 36, then Yahshua came with them, the disciples, to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed because he's feeling the, this, the weight, right, of all this sin and all this, uh, you know, the, the forces allied against him. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Mm. And that's very serious. Remain here and keep watch with me. And this is when he asked the father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not yet as I will, but as you will. And then he goes back and finds them sleeping. And then he says, verse 41, keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. And the word is the same, perosmos, into testing. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So it's, it's the idea of cracking under pressure, right? We're not talking about money here. We're not talking about lust and power. We're talking about uh, the... The, the things that were going to happen. And they did happen because shortly after this, they're chased, right? Peter is, uh, you know, he denies the Messiah. He gives in, right? It, they they sort of failed this, don't they, initially? But then they recover. Well, I shouldn't say they, but Peter at least. But he recovers. And, you know, and, and this is our human condition. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, you will be done, you see. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. And on and on. So it's uh, and it's, it's also reflected in, in what you see over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, right? When Paul is speaking about these things, and he's, he again, this exodus language, right? For I do not want you to be aware, unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. This is leaving Egypt. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. 
and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Messiah. Nevertheless, with most of them, Elohim was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. And this is what we have to pray, that we're not laid low in the wilderness, because we're going through somewhat of a wilderness condition now, right? Now, these things happen as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also crave. Deliver us from evil, right? So we would not crave evil things as they also crave. Do not be idolaters. Do not give in to the forces of evil. Do not give in to the testing as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. No, let us act immorally as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in one day because they cracked. No, let us try the master as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. So they tested Yahweh, right? This is that language is used is deliberate language. And once again, it's Exodus language. What did they do at the waters of Meribah? They tested Yahweh, right? They tested him to see would he give them water, right? He did that through, you know, they, they did that by agitating Moses. So it's, it's do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Do not lead us into testing. Is that just referring to, do not, it says, do not lead us into testing. Is that just Yahweh allowing us to go into personal testing of ourselves? Or does that also mean do not lead us to test him? It's probably a little of both. A little of both. That we get to the point where we're so frustrated with life that we test him and we make conditions for him for our belief in him, right? So going back to 1 Corinthians 10, no, let us try, no, let us test Yahweh as some of them did, and we're destroyed by the serpents. No, grumble as some of them did, and we're destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come, right? Because we're going through that now. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation, no testing, perosmos has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, an Elohim who is faithful, an Elohim is faithful, who will not allow you to be tested, perazzo, beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, perasmos, will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. And there it is. So we want to be able to endure it, right? And then there's more instruction if you keep reading through the chapter. <clears throat> so these are all things that are directly connected with this here. So last thing I want to mention, um, and then we'll, we'll finish up for today, is I mentioned early on when I first started that these things are, it's there's Exodus language here, right? It's an Exodus motif. It's also temple language, right? You're coming before Yahweh, hallowed be your name. And you're you're recognizing, you're acknowledging him, and you're receiving his bread. And, and all these things are, you're acknowledging his kingdom at the temple because the temple is the connecting of heaven and earth. But it's also his Exodus language, his temple language, but it's also vocational language. This is what Yahshua came to do. He 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 regularly acknowledged his father who was in heaven, and he as he called upon his name. He regularly recognized that he was sanctified, as he did in the priestly prayer in John 17. He the, the kingdom message is throughout on, on almost every page of the gospel message, as we've been seeing already, even at the very in the very first chapter of the book of Mark. And he was doing the kinds of things that you would be expected to do in the kingdom. He was healing people. He was uh, exercising dark forces, right? He was, uh, uh, he, was, he was comforting the afflicted and teaching people, right? Give us this day our daily bread. He was feeding people. There's, there's at least two instances where he fed thousands of people as the good shepherd, giving them their bread, both spiritually and, and temporally, right? He forgave people. How many how many times did he forgive people? In the very first chapter of Mark, but I must be thinking of the next chapter here, where he says to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. He wanted to be healed. But it was deeper than that, right? It wasn't just about the healing. It was about healing of the inside, not just the healing of the outside. And the healing of the inside could only be accomplished through forgiveness, right? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk but so that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He says to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. <clears throat> and by the way, where would you go as a, as a pious Jew? Where would you go to receive forgiveness of sins? Where's the only place that you would go? To the temple. So they're saying, why does man speak this way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but Elohim alone? you got to go have, do a sacrifice in the temple to forgive your sins forgiven. 
What is he talking about? I have authority to forgive sins. Why? He didn't quite say it at this moment because he is the temple. Yahshua is the temple. He is the connection between heaven and earth, you see. So forgiveness is a representation of that fact that he has forgiveness to, uh, he has authority to forgive sins. And because we are his servants and his disciples, we also are called to do the same and to forgive others, even as we've been forgiven, right? And then as far as testing, we know about the instance when Yahshua was tested right in the beginning of his ministry, and he was delivered from the evil one as well in that moment because of the weakness that he felt because of his physical condition. And in him doing that, like it says in the book of Hebrews, it was an example for us as well, right? Because he was the high, he is the high priest who knows what it's like to go through the same things that we've gone through, yes? So when you look at all these things, this is all his vocation. Everything that he was doing, it's encapsulated in this model prayer. And the reason it's given to us is so that we don't forget that. So that we constantly, not in a ritualistic way, but so that we're constantly reciting this thing in our heads, in our minds, in our hearts, so that we remember what we're here for. So that we remember that we are following in the master's footsteps and this is how we should live. These are the things that should be important to us. These are the things that we should prioritize. These are the things that should follow us wherever we go and that we should teach wherever we go and that we should implement wherever we go in the way that he has given us based upon the gifts that he has given each and every one of us. And there's more that could be said, but I think that, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there for now. The last thing I, well, the last thing I will say is that you can... You can use this prayer, again, not in a ritualistic sense, but I would encourage you to pray this prayer as a model, to uh, certainly to memorize it. And many of us have memorized it already because we've been saying it from our, from, our, from our childhoods. But you can use this to pray for these things. So as you pray them, not doing it ritualistically, but pray and then meditate, right? Our Father who is in heaven. And then you think as you're praying, and you, you, you understand what he is, what it means to him to be in heaven and to sanctify his name and to take a moment to remember his holiness and to remember how we should be holy before him as well. And then as we describe your kingdom come, you can think of the message in the Beatitudes and you can even read through the Beatitudes. Who says you have to just pray, close your eyes and not reading, right? Prayer is a very interactive thing. You can have your Bible open in front of you and you can have the, the, the Beatitudes open Matthew 5, Right? And you can read through them and you can think in your own life based upon what's happening in your own life right now. How can I implement these things in my life? How can I be kind to the poor? How can I be meek? How can I be humble? How can I do this? How can I do that? How can I be careful not to call my brother fool, Raka, right? How can I be careful not to watch my eyes so that I, they don't go where they don't need to go? How can I make sure I don't have harbor hatred in my heart for somebody and on and on? And as you do that, you're learning the ways of the kingdom, right? So that his kingdom will, will come on this earth as it is in heaven. And then you can remember the daily bread and the provisions, and you can ask Yahweh for your needs, right? Help me to have what I need, because it's not just about bread. It's about your, your needs in general. But how can I also rely upon you and depend upon you? And how can I forgive other people if I have things that personal relationships that are not what they should be now? What things can I do in my life to change those relationships, to have a better attitude and to try to reconcile? And if I'm dealing with certain testings in my life, how can I find ways to get allies to help me? How can I get someone to walk by my side, a coach or a therapist or a counselor or someone who, or a minister, someone who can walk by my side and help me to deal with this particular testing that's going on in my life, whether it's grief that you're going through or a business situation that's gone bad or a relationship situation that's bad or a situation with your son or your daughter or your spouse or a situation of lust or a situation of whatever it may be, of alcohol or substance abuse. And ask Yahweh to put resources in your way to be able to help you to deal with those things so that you don't crack under the pressure. And asking Yahweh always to protect you from the forces of darkness so that because your master has already dealt with that so that you don't have to deal with that and that you could turn it over to him. And if you pray that every day, every other day, once a week, how much better will your life be? How much stronger will you be mentally, spiritually, 
and then how can you help others also to uh, to 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 press ahead so uh, that's where i will leave it today and uh, i hope that's been uh, that's been helpful